I'm Andy Gray and this is Elston Farm. We're in Copplestone in central Devon. And we're on a um, on very red land, very light, um, sandy, loamy soils. We have here a meat business and a, uh, a dog food business, as well as farming livestock and a bit of cereals. I believe it's important to put silvo pasture into commercial farms because uh, I think that it's commercial opportunity, uh, and I think that it, you, things have to make money. And we, you know, as farmers, we uh, we know we need to produce food. And, and this is an opportunity to potentially produce as much, if not more, food and at the same time provide public good in the form of increased biodiversity, improved water quality, um, you know, better porosity, um, drought proofing our, our land, capturing carbon and all the myriad of other benefits that silvo pasture potentially can drive. And also it's potentially other income streams. So, so what we're actually doing is intensifying our production in a, within our own acreage. So what is there not to like if it all works? So on, the, on this farm, the planting designs I've chosen, are, well, there's only one, which is, I suppose you'd call it alley planting, I call it just rows of trees. But So we've planted rows of trees um, 40 metres apart, which gives us a 12 metre cultivation band if ever we want to go back into cereals or, or other crops. And, um, but at the same time provides good shelter for the livestock. And I quite like the idea of, of grazing um, and browsing through these trees in this reasonably dispersed a fashion because it gives for, gives good shelter but also the livestock um, access if you're cell grazing through it to uh, to browse in a in a fairly regimented and, and, and predictable fashion. So there's lots of other reasons why row planting works but part of the reason for this farm is because it's such incredibly good land. I don't want to cut myself off from the opportunity to grow cereals again in the future. What's in here? That's an oak up to there. That's not bad, is it? So here we have a chestnut tree, um, which, is a, which is viewed as a non-indigenous species, but I actually asked if I was allowed to plant them because they feed quite nicely into uh, my future plans with the business. If you can get a month, month to two months, three months of, of continuous chestnut food out of them, then you're extending that, that browsing season where the deer or pigs or whatever it is you're trying to put fat into um, will, be, will actually have opportunities to eat those, uh, those chestnuts and overwinter better. They also add nice flavour to your meat and actually there's a nice story there where a chef wants to put on a blackboard that for pigs been eating chestnuts all autumn, um, then it sort of adds to that story and helps the meat business sell meat. I suppose one of the other interesting things from the point of view of my experience here is the amazing interest that I'm getting from other farmers. So I'm probably getting one to two groups of 15 to 25 farmers a, a month coming to have a look and have a listen. Uh, and I don't tell them it's your future, I just, just say have a look and see what you think and it might work for you, it might not work for you. I, I mean farmers uh, have been around the job for long enough to know that, um, that not everything works and we've seen a few mad ideas foisted on us in the past. To my mind, this doesn't look like a mad idea, but it probably does to other people. It gives us the chance to stress test ideas. It gives us the chance to look at the economics and actually, you know, experience it. The other thing is in life, that life is full of unexpected consequences. And, and, and what we're doing really is finding out those unexpected consequences so other farmers can actually come and see and hear and listen and find out what they are, um, both good and bad. And I'm sure we'll have both.